Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, folks, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and on today's episode, we're going to tell the story of pride, greed, theft, hubris, and showmanship in East Tennessee. It's the story of the 1982 Knoxville World's Fair and the two bankers who made it possible. Well, possible at least before they went to federal prison, Rod. This is unreal, Steve. You know, I had a chance to go to the Knoxville World's Fair, but I passed up the opportunity because... I don't know. It just didn't seem like it was the thing that I wanted to do at the time. But, you know, I had a lot of people that told me it was a really fun event to go to. But it just wasn't my thing at the time. But a lot of people bragged about it, said it was a really great event. But it's sort of like that thing I guess we've talked about before. It's sort of the apple that looked good on the outside, Mm -hmm. but it was really rotten to the core on the inside. And we're going to tell you that story today. In 1974, Spokane, Washington hosted a World's Fair as a way to bring attention to that city, and that led to the president of the Downtown Knoxville Association, one W. Stewart Evans, to wonder why his fair city on the banks of the Tennessee River couldn't do the same thing. Well, Mr. Evans presented the idea to the Knoxville city government, and then Mayor Kyle Testerman thought it to be such a good idea that he appointed local banker and wannabe politician Jake Butcher to head a committee to explore just how that might be done leading Butcher to be the driving force behind the fair, with locals referring to the project as Jake's Fair. Well, Jake Butcher was born in Union County, Tennessee. He was the son of a Union County Bank president and the brother of C.H. Butcher, Jr. Banking ran strong in both the Butcher brothers' blood, and by 1968, they began buying stock in several Tennessee banks and looking to build an empire. By 1974, they owned or controlled 11 banks, and Jake's United American Bank controlled over one-third of all banking reserves in Knoxville. And that was just Jake. C.H. owned city and county bank at the same time. Jake Butcher also had political ambitions as well. In 1974, he sought the Democratic nomination for governor of Tennessee, losing to well-known pardon salesman, (laughs) wow, pardon salesman, Ray Blanton, who was so out and out corrupt that the legislature put his successor, Lamar Alexander, who beat Butcher in 1978, into office early in order to put a stop to Blanton's last-minute sale of pardons to hardened criminals. But that's a story for another podcast. He also ran for state treasurer, losing by, get this, Steve, one vote. He never managed to get himself elected to any office. Wow. I guess that's some kind of record, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Well, the fair was not universally liked at first. Knoxville City Councilman and personality Kaz Walker was probably the most prominent citizen who opposed the fair. But even he wasn't able to stop the train once it got rolling, and roll on the train did. $46 $46 million was raised through bonds, thanks in large part to the Butcher Brothers, along with $38 million in illegal insider loans from the Butcher Banks to pay for this extravaganza. Funds were used to buy a 70-acre site between downtown Knoxville and the home of the Vols, the University of Tennessee. This site included slums and a deteriorating l and railroad yard and depot. The railroad yard was ripped out, except for one line, and the depot was turned into a restaurant. Buildings were built to showcase energy projects from around the world, with the centerpiece being the Sun Sphere, a 266-foot-tall steel tower topped with a five-story golden globe, as we've pictured in the blog entry for this podcast at storiespodcast.net. Go take a look at it. In fact, Rod, this tower is world famous for being in an episode of a very well-known animated TV show, which was... The Simpsons. (laughs) Okay. Well, now that my singing debut has now been botched, all went pretty much according to plan, and the fair opened on May 1st, 1982, with the theme of Energy Turns the World. And the opening ceremony was a grand one, too. President Ronald Reagan made an appearance to open the fair to the public. Dinah Shore was the master of ceremonies, and, oh boy, Porter Wagner 
and Ricky Skaggs performed to the opening crowd of 87,659 on that opening day. You could get in for, get this, $9.95 or get a six-month pass for $100. Wow, that seems cheap considered nowadays. Among the exhibits was the Hungarian Pavilion's giant Rubik's Cube, all 216 cubic feet of it, and China's exhibit of a 20-foot solar-powered dragon boat and an actual piece of the Great Wall of China and Australia brought windmills, moving sidewalks and kangaroos. Over 11 million people attended the World's Fair, which was accompanied by massive traffic on Interstates 40 and 75 through town. Wasn't that a part of all that malfunction junction stuff, Steve, that, that they talked about so much? That is exactly what it was. You know, That's I, what I thought. I-640, the Knoxville Bypass, and all that attendant construction that took place in the late 70s and early 80s is a direct result of expected traffic because of the fair and all that construction, again, malfunction junction down there in Knoxville. Oh, it was a mess, too. Well, by the time of the fair, Jake and C.H. Butcher's banking empire was under increasing scrutiny, though. It appears that the Butcher brothers had treated their banking empire as their own little playground. Now, there were stories of partying. In one account, there were parties where their friends would meet at one of the various banks, liquor flowing, and eventually the partiers ended up playing catch with bundles of money the size of a football or Pulling out a million dollars just because these folks wanted to see what a million dollars looked like. You've got to be kidding me. No, no. that's Now, I don't know if that's verified, but those are some of the stories that came out of this whole instance. Oh, my gosh. Well, the feds had long suspected that both butchers had been engaged in unlawful banking practices, but they never managed to catch them. You see, the brothers were engaged in constantly moving funds from one bank to another bank to another bank, in order to keep the banks from collapsing under a Ponzi scheme designed to cover the fact that they weren't getting enough money on their fixed loans to pay the interest on their customers' deposits during that time of high interest rates in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent interest. Mm -hmm. This constant movement of money almost, almost, Rod, covered the tracks, but not quite. Well, the feds were determined to figure out what was going on. So, on the day after the World's Fair closed, November 1st, 1982, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or better known as FDIC, the regulators, swooped in and raided all, I mean all, of the Butcher Brothers' 29 bank branches and offices and took control of their empire. Investigation uncovered evidence of a slew of illegal loans, forged documents, and other fraud, as well as those massive transfers from one bank to another to keep the whole enterprise from collapsing like a deck of cards. And on Valentine's Day, 1983, the United American Bank collapsed, making it the fourth largest bank failure in U.S. history before the Great Recession. By the time the year was over, seven other butcher banks became insolvent, along with C.H. Butcher's Southern Industrial Banking Corporation, a state-licensed savings and loan. In all, the FDIC estimated that the failed bank's losses would total about $382 million. Well, in the end, Jake Butcher pled guilty to federal charges of bank fraud in 1985, and he was sentenced to 20 years, but paroled in 1992, and eventually ended up in the Atlanta suburbs with his assets auctioned off to satisfy creditors. C.H. was also sentenced to federal prison and was paroled in 1993 and passed away in 2002. And the uh, fair, Rod? Well, it's left its mark, too, after closing with a $57 profit. Oh, you're kidding me. No, $57. I never knew how much it made. (laughs) Well, the Sun Sphere still stands in the former World's Fair site, along with the Rubik's Cube, Sadly, though, the U.S. Pavilion had to be demolished in a controlled blast due to structural failure, and that site is now where a parking lot is located along Cumberland Avenue. And every July 4th, the Knoxville Symphony plays a free concert with fireworks at the site. Now, if I'm not mistaken, do they still have a restaurant there at the Sun Sphere? Yeah, I believe they do. 
yeah, I know that they used to. I know that they've they've had some restaurants there that's been in sometimes. They go out of business, and then somebody else puts one in there and stuff. But it's it's been fairly close, and I think it's close down there to a convention center, or they've got a convention center that's close by down there. But you know, I know that they had a restaurant down there at one time. But you know, that's the only thing that is really left besides that Rubik's cube of uh, that former World's Fair site, and you know, it was just unreal all of that stuff and like i said i didn't get a chance to go to that but when i go through knoxville that's the one thing that i see every time when i go through knoxville and that's the one noticeable thing on the skyline is that sun sphere every time you go through knoxville yeah that is knoxville's symbol now and that's the story of the 1982 knoxville world's fair and the butcher brothers another story in the history of appalachia thanks for listening you can subscribe to the podcast at itunes stitcher or Google Play, or on your favorite podcast app. If you have a story you'd like to hear and you want us to tell it to you, let us know by dropping us an email at storyteller at storiespodcast.net. We're on Facebook at Facebook slash Stories of Appalachia, and we're on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Till next time, take care. So long, everybody. 